Hello, and thank you very much, and thank you to Kate and Leone for today. It's fantastic. Um, so as a place to start, uh, as a place to start to think uh, with things about material culture, let me first make some introductions. These are my cylinders, and uh, over there they left earlier this afternoon, perhaps under the anticipated uh, weight of your gazes. Uh, they kind of exited for a short while, they returned, so I thought I would back that up in case they decided to leave again with some images of them. These are of, of a different order, obviously. So, uh, everyone, these are my cylinders, and cylinders, these are everyone. And in case you didn't notice, they just slightly nodded their heads at you, performing a very small act of recognition. And of course, in this manner of introduction, I'm already attempting to make these things personal. I'm staking the claim that somehow these things belong and with me, while at the same time pushing them forward to you, onto you, as things in themselves, as objects worthy of your attention. What these introductions between you, me and these cylinders do is already attempt to establish these cylinders as somehow placed within a flat ontology, as material objects which deserve the same respect, attention and care as you and I give to one another. It also attempts to establish their own autonomy. For while at the moment I am wedded to these objects, it is a relationship of betrothal as such, as Katie has been to her Francis Galton weather maps, although it is slightly more of a friendship, um, as Matt has been to his meteorite, and as Emily to her ten-legged stool, this marriage, established for the mutual benefit and support of both them and me, is soon coming to an end. We will separate, we will become divorced, and therefore I ask myself, what has this relationship really been about? What benefit have we offered to one another? One aspect that has come to the fore for me is the particularity of these objects. Certainly as manufactured things, they, conceptually at least, are three material objects of a type, of a manufactured form, all made from the same chemical components of sodium and aluminium salts of stearic acid, free acid and soft beeswax to temper the mix all pressed into the same moulds, packaged up in similar cardboard tubes and then placed in packing boxes at their factory, ready to be shipped out. Here, in the factory shipping warehouse, these three objects were at their most pristine. They were at their most alike. However, after this point, they begin to take on their own personalities. They were shipped out to particular locations across the globe, finding homes in individual offices and put to work at the service of different owners through the intermediaries of their secretaries. These objects were recorded upon, played back. They had their recordings erased. They were stored on shelves in a certain order. They were taken out and recorded upon again. Time and their use at the individual hands and voices have marked them in certain ways, and they were marked. And so here is just an inky thumbprint on the uh, box that was laid over. So here we find them in 2014 as three objects in UCL's physiology collection, one blank, one broken, and one recorded upon but unplayable. These objects are alternatively empty, ruined, or used up. Could these ideas of emptiness, the ruin, and the used up offer up to us, to the study of material culture, what could they do for us? Are these simply empty figures that seem to offer more than they can actually deliver? And this is the question I come to in my upcoming divorce. In order to address this, I turn to another figure for thinking about material culture, one that comes through visual culture. So I want to start here. Um, in visual culture theorist W.J.T. Mitchell's book, What Do Pictures Want?, which I think is an urgent question, The Lives and Loves of Images, a title which seems to resonate with this, with this project, um, an anal analysis of iconoclasm centred around the vandalism of Marcus Harvey's Myra and Chrysophilly's Black Virgin spurs Mitchell to asking what is it not, what is it not about images or rather image objects as he, call, he calls the chapter offending objects but rather what is it about people that make them so susceptible to becoming offended by objects in asking why these objects, artworks are attacked after noting that the image object is transparently and immediately linked to what it represents, Mitchell goes on to note that, and I am doing a bit of a slippage here, I understand, the image, and I'm substituting the object here, 
possesses a kind of vital living character that makes it capable of feeling what is done to it, and this is an assumption that, that he critiques. Through this unpicking, Mitchell goes on to argue that the image hyphen object, they're often treated as texts, and in their textuality, their offensiveness comes from their presumed ability to say something offensive. Against this, he writes, but images are not words. It's not clear that they actually say anything. The verbal message or speech act must be brought to them by the spectator who projects a voice into the image, reads a story into it. Continuing his analysis, Mitchell argues that, in what I would argue is one of the most productive ideas in visual and material culture, that a picture, or as I would say an object, is less like a statement or speech act then than like a speaker capable of an infinite number of utterances so that an image, or maybe a thing as we can consider it, is not a text to be read, but a ventriloquist's dummy into which we project our own voices. And so his argument continues that you know, if we become offended by images and objects and artworks and stuff, we're essentially becoming offended by the ventriloquist's dummy that we are operating. But here with this slide, this next slide, and I rather love this image of this rather creepy thing, um, is an amazing image of a ventriloquist dummy with an with a identity card a kind of Bertillon identity card. And so it gets its own identity. We see this becoming its own thing. It gets its own autonomy. And in its animation, uh, Mitchell notes that the voice must not simply be thrown into the inanimate object. It must seem to make the object speak with its own voice. And this is an idea that's come up again and again today. And he says, this is because the really good ventriloquist, and maybe this is what we're aiming towards, Uh, doesn't simply impose his voice on the mute thing, but expresses in some way the autonomy and specificity of that thing. This analysis of offending objects through the use of the figure of the ventriloquist dummy moves from the mute world of things to the animated realm of objects by paying attention to the materiality of the object itself, to its specificity. But what I'm conscious of doing, and what I'm conscious of doing with you today, is using the figure of the ventriloquist dummy to speak about my cylinders, And in doing so, I seem to be losing sight of them. So let's return to the objects of his hand. At the centre of these objects are these reamed spirals, carved into the blanks so that the cylinders could be slotted onto phonograph machines. By placing ourselves into these inner reamed limes, we might begin to travel with and through our material world, which in the first instance might present a multi-dimensional object. And I'm very conscious of doing this again and again in the project, is constantly turning this, this, these set of objects over in my head. And I mentally turn them over as semiotic forms, as pieces of dead technology, as mediators and constructors of gender relations in the office, etc., etc., etc. And so what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to leave them there. I'm going to leave them for you to turn over again and again and again, because they are as much your objects as they are mine.